previously on Kerbal Collaborative Warfare. Dear leader, masterminds the liberation of Bembe, sending forth the heavy weapons platform, the Breddick Golash. Meanwhile, at Cola Crater, the Cthulian forces win the day with their newest helicopter technology, the Wasp. Dear friend and glorious ally Penguin, rebuilds Jebediah Kerman, advancing Kerbal reanimation technology by thousands of years. The glorious hero, now known as Mech Jeb, made a heroic strike against the very dark Nazi heart of the tape's domain at the KSC2. Unfortunately, Mech Jeb was lost, securing the victory. The evil Nazi war criminal tape, outraged at what he perceives to be a theft of his materials, directs his full military fury at Penguin's base Hamburg Cape. Destroying all defences and taking back what he perceives to be his military hardware. <laughs> Evil Chairman Agonarch of A Industries displays his superior helicopter design and piloting skills by attacking Ben Bay. Hey guys and welcome back to Kerbal Collaborative Warfare, the version of Kerbal Space Program where we have taken the bases of Kerbin side and the weapons of BD Armory, split ourselves up into nations and are going to war for the glory of the planets. You catch up with me as we are feeling quite a strong sense of deja vu here. Agonarch has of course taken over Ben Bay and we have of course responded with the same vessel that we responded with last time. The breaded Golash, the heavy we weapons platform of doom that Dear Leader is quite enamoured with it has to be said. Especially after the performance it put in last time defending the base from Agonarch. But that is not what we're going to do with it this time. Though it, we are going to start off doing things in a very similar way including with using these cruise missiles to try and like have a preemptive strike at the orb weaver and just just see what happens it's always a very good way to open up my turn by launching a missile from Kerman Lake to Ben Bay I'm getting quite quite used to it I'm quite loving it. it it's it's real good here also lets me see what's going on now obviously I have been out there I've had a look around using my weather satellite uh, and I know that there is only a single orb weaver there a bit of debris next to it and then this whole mess of stuff to the left here this was very confusing when I first uh, first got the save it wasn't until Agonarch released his video that I, I knew exactly what was going on there uh, you can see there are a lot of other glitchy things um, up and around uh, if you look towards the horizon just above Ben Bay you'll see there is a little puff of smoke that's something that's constantly there and now on the left hand side as well there is also some sort of exhaust that seems to constantly be there I'm not sure what all that is about I'm not sure if it's got any sort of impact on our performance or even if it's going to impact the war at all I'd like to take a plane and fly through it and, and see what I can do especially as one of them appears to be a ring so I need to go do that but okay we're coming in here for our attack round against Agonarch and whilst we had something that looked like a strike what appears to to happen is both my missiles actually hit that hangar bay there or whatever it is that's next to the helipad i do appear to have knocked off the um the pod from the bottom of the orb weaver there that that was quite nice so obviously we didn't really have the ideal line for that so we're gonna have to move uh, as always with the hover tanks not the simplest operation but it's something that i'm getting a little bit used to especially with all the rockets and now the rcs on this uh, this platform here we can definitely do things a lot smoother than we did on our first iteration though the shredded panache the small one that is by far the, my favored hover tank technique but we need something that is big and powerful and defensive just like the breaded galash here so on Agonarch's last turn he alluded to the fact that maybe these hover tanks have a little bit of an issue dealing with hills and I am actually inclined to agree with him taking these things over land it's a bit of a headache it's a hard job it's a hard slog it's something you've got to be extremely cautious about I mean even just running down this little slope here I am I'm nervous I'm very nervous I'm cautious I'm taking my my time and firing my forward rockets to try and just slow ourselves down if I went down that slope too fast I would plow into the ground and then everything would be pretty horrendous just like if I went over the top of the hill too fast I could then get a little bit of air and this thing doesn't land very well I mean it's not a plane it's not meant for that type of thing uh, you can see here I'm just trying to stop so I can get a quick save so I'm going to cut the vast majority of this. For those of you that want to actually see the full turn play out in its entirety, I am going to release the epic unedited version of this segment. But it is like two, two and a bit hours long if I, if I did that. So I'm not going to do that here. We're in fact going to cut forward just a little bit here to settling down on the shoreline here so I can get a good line at Agonarch. 
At the beginning of the turn, I basically wasted a second missile by firing two at once without figuring out whether I was in the right place or not. So, once I've started slowing myself down, and my technique here is quite simple, I look at my prograde, uh, I fire my forward facing rocket so I slow down and then use my sideways ones to make sure my prograde stays in front of me until the point where everything nulls out and then I just turn off the anti-grav. But yeah, because I uh, I sent that second missile off and it seemed like a bit of a waste to me last time, we're just going to send the one off this time. And the biggest problem I had here was, as always, trying to target the Orb Weaver. There's just always so much rubbish around it. Uh, possibly my own fault. I could definitely, like, when I come here with a tank or any one of my defensive units or anything like that, just spend some time going around blowing up all the debris. Wouldn't take me long. Would probably be quite a lot of fun thinking about it as well. So coming up on the left, we have Agonarch's Graveyard. I'm full on not sure what to do about this. There's at least two probes there that have t Kerbals in them. I don't know whether I should go out and capture them, just leave them there for he him to come and like retake back. I'm pretty sure that's what was trying to go on with the helicopter. He was coming along to try and pick up the Mosquito, was it? And then <laughs> hilariously he crashed into it and hit the wrong key or something. I don't know. It was, it was good fun to watch anyway. You see to the bottom left there is the other smoke trail that I, I keep talking about. And I'd also raised my altitude up because I was remembering back to those first missiles, the one that's uh, impacted with the hangar bay. So I'm coming in from a kilometre high, coming down uh, at quite a steep angle, and I think this has paid off. I don't, ha I don't have any of my buildings in my way. So here we go. Boom! I thought that was going to be amazing. Like, when I saw that flying in there to come and take it all out, I was like, ah, got it damn straight but I didn't it just blew a bit off okay so here's something a bit weird I go to uh, switch to the bread of glash and I find myself looking at the orb weaver debris uh this happened almost every time that I swapped over swapped back to the glash after watching an attack it was a bit weird I just went back to whatever my my target was very crazy this was the only time things exploded though and I think that's just kind of carry over from the heat of the the cruise missiles uh so I won't be showing any more of those horrible glitches it'll just be Cut, up, cut away. Okay, so I'm going to fire two more cruise missiles. Again, the hardest thing is trying to target him, but, you know, we'll, we'll get over that. And because this is an epically long bit, and that, that cruise missile flight takes like two, three minutes, I'm going to cut ahead to show you missile launch, followed by the good bit. This is the closing in section. You can see one of them already struck in. Uh, maybe I should have cut a little bit further back. I actually sent two missiles there, one low, one high. The first one came in, built up a little bit of heat at the bottom. Nothing exploded other than the missile, but when this second one came in, well, you can you can see the absolute devastation here. I was a little bit worried about the guns that are attached to the uh, m missile, uh, sorry, not missile, manager, the weapon manager that we're just about to go to right there. Um, but it turns out it's got no ammo. Um, and nothing like that so everything should be all right didn't actually know that it didn't have any ammo at the time i was just terrified of it another bit that i think i'm going to cut off is the sea journey over but i want to show you the transition from land to water because that's always a slightly slightly tense moment a dodgy moment uh, so the first thing i do is just like go off at full speed and try and do my best to get my pro grade marker headed towards uh sort of the water in a perpendicular fashion i don't want to be going on at a sort of a, a slight slant so i'm half in the water half off for loads of time i just want to go go straight on, hit it 90 degrees, and uh, try and make that jump. Uh, so I've decided that I'm going a little bit faster this time. Uh, so I'm just deploying all my air, air brakes and trying to uh, use the brakes on the wheels underneath. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite cutting the mustard, so I fired up my rockets, slowed myself down, made it across onto the water, and was like, okay, brilliant. Let's make our way over to Ben Bay. So we have a few events of interest about the liberation of the Ben Bay here. Uh, you can see right here something that I thought was going to be an end to the mission. I had great plans, great ambitions. I really thought we were going to do well. And now I just go and hit this bit of land and everything's going to actually be all right. This was the bit that I thought everything was going to really end. I caught the water, but I don't know. Everything just seemed to work out fine. I was braking the entire time. You can see at the front I've got some scaled down mainsails there to, to help slow me down in time. I don't know if they uh, cushioned my fall somewhat, or, uh, but I don't know. It, it just went really well. Uh, and now we've got five minutes of being scared. In fact, it's more than five minutes, but uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you I'm going to cut out five minutes worth of footage. Uh, we are going to just slowly drift our way towards Ben Bay and try and fire some bullets over the lip here. We're just going to keep spraying and as I say, there's 
a lot of time here. So what I'm going to do is cut ahead a little bit, show you a few of the explosions that I actually did manage to cause. There weren't many. Uh, most of the time I was just spraying bullets off the side of the uh, landing platform there. But that was all right. Uh, the, I was just trying to be safe. I was just trying to be super safe. I didn't know that there was no uh, ammo attached to it. And maybe this was the time when I took out the ammo. But all in all, when we got to this point, which is only a few meters off the edge of the coastline here, everything seems safe. I'm not sure that it's actually got line of sight on me at the moment, but I have been cruising from out of the mouth of Ben Bay all the way down to this coastline, so I, I'm feeling that it's kind of safe. I've even tried uh, using the howitzer to get a couple of uh, better shots on it, because the howitzer has a nice arc to it, whereas bullets are always straight. Bringing ourselves to a bit of a stop here, using the same technique as we did over on the coastline, looking towards our retrograde, firing our reverse thrusts. Well, actually, this time I'm just letting the gradient of the hill slow me down, and then using our lateral rockets to make sure that we stay nice and stable and pointed in the right direction. So now that we're all safe, it's time to take a quick sa quick save, well, a quick, quick save, you heard me, and have a look at the rubble that is the remains of the orb weaver. It looks pretty safe, but I am still worried about that little uh, conglomerate of stuff at the front there. Not enough for me to actually get out and do anything about it. It all looks safe, and I don't have uh, exact line of sight to double check. But the second part of any liberation process is, of course, putting the flag down. So we're going to get Wilgie Kerman out, our specially trained troop, for many, many months. She's been going out, erecting rods, putting down bits of cloth, colouring them in in all sorts of different colours, and just a putting flags up everywhere for the glory of leader. Even with all that training, naming and uh, commenting on a flag is difficult, but we have called it Ben Bay, and there ain't no glory like leader's glory. Yeah. Okay, now we just need to get Wilgie Kerman back onto the bread of galash here, and it was about this time that I realised I haven't actually put any ladders on or anything like that, so we're going to have a bit of difficulty doing that. My first thought is maybe I can climb up the landing gear here. Turns out, no, that, that was a, a rubbish assumption there. So we're going to uh, cycle through try and find the bread of ganache again and drop down our braking wheels at the bottom there. Uh, we don't quite get them all the way down to the floor but that that's fine. We're just looking for some way to get purchase on the machine here and I figured these are the things that get down lowest. I could have tried climbing up the missiles but that's, that's always a slightly uh, dodgy proposition. So we're going to just jump at these landing gear and try our best to uh, manage to hammer onto the climb. It, it happens and we managed to get quite a way up towards the fuel tanks. Now I'm looking around wondering where I can go to get up. So I'm thinking down on this little wing, wing section that I've got underneath to provide some stability might be the way forwards. So I jump forward, start hammering the F key, ragdoll and find my way, not just on the floor but also under the water. So I guess Wilgie's um, staying here. We can leave her in charge of all the, like, the defences or something like that. But we are moving on. That could have been the end of operations for the bread at Galash. We've, we turned up at our occupied base, we took it out, well we liberated it, let's, let's use the correct te the terminology here. But if we just left it at that, I'm fairly sure Agonarch would once again come along and try and cause some trouble here. So, we're going to make a strike back against the forces of T. Just across the water, there is the base of Bit Sandy. Now, Bit Sandy is the place that, for starters, is a proper T alliance base. Both Agonarch and T Tape use that base, so that makes it quite a prime t uh, target for me. But also, it is on my continent. And I will not, not stand for that. This is Leader's Continent, and only Leader, and maybe a few of Penguins, can have bases here. So, first things first, we need to get out of Ben Bay. This seems like quite a trivial matter, until I found this buoy in the middle of the bay here. And wow, scrapes just past it. I, like, really honestly, truly believed that the Bread of Galash's mission was going to end there. Uh, I was just headed straight for that, and even with my rocket on the side firing at full blast, it didn't look like I was going to get past it. But we scraped by with millimetres to spare, and now we've got quite a distance to kind of trek across the, the, the ocean here, all the way across the Curb Atlantic. In fact, if we just take a few more minutes to talk about our way through here, we should start spending up into the map. And as you can see here, so we've got the got my continent on the left, we've got Bit Sandy, Brown Rock, the tip on the right, and that is where I am headed. So once again, I'm not going to make you watch all this. If you want to watch it, link on the screen for the unlisted 
unedited, full-length version of my turn. But we are going to cut ahead to within sight of the coastline on the other side of the Kerblantic. I, I think this is the Kerblantic, right? Or well, the Clothulian Sea? Maybe this is the Clothulian Sea? Because we've got the Clothulian Continent, North Clothu on one side. And this is the Clothulian Peninsula on the other with Brown Rock and Bit Sandy in the tip. So, yeah, I've now, I hereby, in the name of leader, rename this stretch of water as the Cthulian Sea. Anyone likes to argue with me about it, they can come and answer to, like, my combined military might or something. Penguin will back me up. Anyway, we are essentially in recon mode right now. I am like, taking a look at all these beaches around and trying to figure out where would be a good place to put the, uh, the breaded galash up for... Well, mainly for a quick save. I've been... Going across this water for oh, about an hour and a half now. It, it was some time. It was longer than the mission time uh, shows because obviously with all the stuff on the map, our games are ticking a bit slower than normal. Uh, but I'm going to go and just, just perch up on this beach over here. Uh, if we zoom out a little bit more, you can see that Bit Sandy is over two hills. That, that puts me in a safe position. Uh, as always with the hover tank, uh, cover is my friend. Almost every single one of the BD AI turrets and stuff is a much better shot than me. Like, much better shot than me. They, they, they're there waiting for me to do stuff, whereas I'm trying to figure out what it is that I'm going to do, uh, and that always puts me on the back step, even though I'm on the front step. So I sped the footage up just a little bit more because coming in for landings on a on a beach is always the the slowest of operations. I don't want to go cruising at the beach at any sort of reasonable speed. I mean, as it is, we're coming in at 40 meters per second, something like that, and I think that is far too fast. I like to try and make the transition at about 20 20 meters per second. I'm not sure what speed that is in terms what of what everyone else will. Uh, understand in either kilometers or miles per hour but 20 meters per second is generally the the target i aim for here it also means that i'm uh, not got too much momentum to bleed off when i get onto a hill like this so that when i want to come in for a stop like i am doing right now all i need to do is fire my lateral thrusters and everything should fire off nicely so, finding ourselves in a nice position, like, just over the hill from tape. I think we're going to test the waters with a cruise missile, just in the same way as we did back at Ben Bay uh, and Kerman Lake. So, we're going to fire one off and just see what can happen. Now, the flak cannon that's there, when we were watching Agon Archers go, uh, had glitched out or something on his save, and I thought I would come across and just kind of walked my way in. Unfortunately, the first thing I did when I found the save was to go and have a look and, and see if the glitch was still there. But no, no, it, w it was a defended base, so, you know... Proponents of tea, be aware that I did have to fight for this base. It's not something I just walked in and took. So we sent over a relatively low altitude cruise missile, mainly because I'm worried about the flat cannon being able to take it out, because the flat cannon is very good against missiles. Unfortunately, I sent it far too low, and it managed to clip the top of the hill, blew up. I did learn that the flat cannon has countermeasures on it from that, though, so it wasn't a complete waste of time. Uh... This does tell me, though, that I cannot send missiles over. If I send missiles over, he's just going to use his countermeasures. They're going to be completely useless. I'm literally just going to waste them. So I'm going to see if I can get a little bit closer, maybe take a little bit of a lob shot over the hill to try and get the flat cannon. But this involves a lot of cruising around. So there's like the thing on the left of me right now, the landmass on the left of me right now, is a nice little peninsula that st sticks out into the water in between me and tape. So what I'm going to do is go round the, the other end of the side of that peninsula and ground myself up on the beach there to try and see if I can just get a better view. More, more over to see if I can get a better aim, but if I can't get the aim that I'm after, maybe I could uh, see where I could go and get the aim. If, if there was a nice little bay somewhere or some sort of divot, or, or something like that. I don't know, maybe on the other side of the base. Not wishing to foreshadow anything too much there. But before we do any of that, I need to take a complete stop, make a quick save, and actually go take a bit of a break. Because I'd been at this for something like two and a bit hours at this point, And I really just wanted to chill out and take a break. So, when we come back, I will be doing super speed. Because I've already noticed how far along we are. So, when I came back, the first thing I noticed was that I couldn't get a direct shot on, on tape. No matter, no matter what I used, whether it was the howitzer, the goalkeeper. Uh, and as I had already previously pointed out, all my missiles were being waylaid by his countermeasure, or we're going to anyway. Uh, but I did notice that he is tucked in tight against the hill on this side of the base. So maybe if I went to the other side, I'd be able to get some sort of hook shot on my, my howitzer. Which means that we've got a lot more driving to do. Now, I, I love these hover tanks, don't get me wrong. I, I really do enjoy them. But when I'm taking them out on big missions like this, they, they do 
they do drag a little. They're, they're, they're quite slow. So I'm going to cover this trip in a series of couple of jump cuts. Well, basically, it's just going to be two jump cuts. One to get over that little island strip there. And we are headed just over there towards that divot on the other side. Uh, always coming up onto the land is a bit of a worry, but we, we make it up there nice and fine. And then we're going to try and navigate our way around this area now obviously this side of the of the island i've not seen well it's not really an island this side of the peninsula i've not really seen i don't really know the lay of the land all that well but what i'm going to try and do is get myself angled up on this hill here and see if we can uh, score a hit on tape using the howitzer i'm not feeling overly hopeful not just on being able to hit tape but also being able to park on a slope like this uh the gravity involved is, is quite quite strong and these legs they're not the the grippiest of landing gear it has to be said uh if you know i am walking down on the back legs there like that as they're they're wobbling around uh a quick moment to take up uh, to zoom out and have a look we could not get tape we could only shoot over the top of him so that was no good we're gonna have to try and find uh, a bit of a lower hill, maybe a valley or a, like a saddle in the mountain. If you look almost directly in front of me, I can see one there, but I don't think that's the one we're going for. I think we're going for the one on the left. Which means Dombert is going to have a whole load more of fancy flying to do. Yeah, so that saddle just in front of us there, that's the one that I decided to go for. Uh, mainly because it was like a nice straight line and also it was the closest one to me. At this point, I've been driving around for a long time. Even with my brake, I thought that it was starting to drag on a little bit here. So we're, we're going to just try and surmount this hill in the best possible manner. We are then also going to try and make a... Make a landing. A landing's not real. We're gonna we're gonna try and like put down and see if we can shoot over the the top of this hill. Uh, just trying to keep pointed in the right direction is my trick here. And there we go. We have landed down nicely, and we're going to see what we can shoot here. Uh, not very much uh, to make it over the top of the hill. We also then end up going over the top of tape. Which isn't what we were going for. I also had noticed that the building uh, bit sandy there was in front of us. Like the hangar or whatever that was, was between me and tape. So I've now just come out from un behind the shadow of that building. And we're going to see if we can uh, keep pointed in the right direction. Unfortunately, as I push myself down to the floor, we kind of wiggle round to the right and get a little bit of twist involved. I'm not sure exactly what happened there but you can tell by all the different engines that are firing up and stopping and and just winding up and winding now this was actually quite a, a hard surface to make any sort of land fall upon i'm not entirely sure what i could do to actually improve the uh, ground based stability here maybe put some sort of struts behind between the landing gear but even that i don't think is going to be ideal so after a little bit of mucking around i've decided that I'm not really going to be able to shoot over the crest of the hill at tape. Things are awkward. Things aren't really going all that well. So if I just kind of push myself over and hope for the best here, uh, I'm going to unleash as much as I can. But explosions are rattling around me everywhere. Thankfully, that first uh, block with the, with the uh, goalkeeper on top seemed to have actually sent enough bullets his way that I didn't actually have to dodge all that much explosions so everything kind of worked out all right there were four explosions around me and then nothing came my way so i'm going to take that as a victory and we're going to roll down towards the towards where tape's position is now i could have taken the right hand path and maybe that would have given me a more direct run but i've decided that i'm going to come in on the left so that i can stay hidden from any possibilities of uh, revenge attack from tape's flat cannons uh penguin did did tell me or in fact i saw on penguin's video that the flat cannon has a uh, uncanny back from the dead ability that just because you've shot it doesn't mean that its weapon is taken out. So I'm, I'm going to be ultra cautious here. Unfortunately, I think I was too cautious. What I could have done is just like swung round and blown stuff up. But I'm trying to get a shot over the top of this building here. Turns out that was not a very good one. Uh, so I've I'm thinking that maybe that's because of the goalkeeper. As I have uh, previously said, the goalkeeper has a habit of shooting in a very, very straight line. Whereas the howitzer can kind of arc its shot up and down. So maybe we'll try something uh, like that. I'm trying to back up a little bit here to try and get that arching shot. But once again, uh, the arch is too much and it will just overshoot the, the top of all of tape stuff. So I've decided that maybe we're going to go up this ramp here. Now this might not have been the smartest choice of mine, but it does display that I have taken like complete control of this hover vehicle. We, you know, this, this ramp is barely wider than the vehicle itself. I, I don't know, maybe like half as much again as wide as the vehicle itself. And we, we managed to go up almost dead on centre. The only time that I have any troubles at all is when we come to the top here. And that's because I didn't want to just like blow full power over the top and then not be able to stop and drive my, drive my way into that wall in front of us there. 
looking at the pile of debris in front of us, I think we managed to uh, completely destroy tape on that first shot. And if it wasn't that first shot with the goalkeeper, the howitzer shot shells that followed up must have surely done as much damage. So I'm now thinking about where we're going to put this vehicle down. There are many variables that are going to come into play with this. One is the hangar. Where, where's the hangar? The other is obviously going to be the hill that was protecting tape. And I also want to try and figure out where Agonarch or tape or anyone from the T Alliance might come from. Uh, the next thing I want to worry about is all this debris here. I, I, this is a mistake that I made at Ben Bay, is leaving all the debris around. So I'm going to go around and blow a few things up. But one thing I very quickly notice is... There is an invincible part there. I, I think it's the wheels. Um, almost every wheel from Kerbal Foundry seems to be ridiculously overpowered. Okay, so you remember Wilgie Kerman, the brave soldier that we left back at Ben Bay? Well, she has been reassigned, and she's been reassigned to this defensive structure. It is, of course, the Weeble Dalek. Uh, it's got a bit of an unstable bottom, and it looked a little bit like a Dalek to me, so we call it the Weeble Dalek. I am just doing a few experiments to try and find out what my closest uh, closest attack ranges. As you can see there, it's within a couple of meters, so that's pretty good. Uh, no, no, these... Sorry, none of these bits are firing at me, so this is all good. And maybe we can go around and destroy a few bits. These bits that are super close to me here are just going to have to live live this close to me. But some of these bits I can definitely blow up here. Now, most of the uh, design features taken on this Weeble Dalek are almost direct rip-offs from the Orb Weaver. I've got like a load of missiles around the outside. I've got some upward-facing guns. Uh, I've used 30mm cannons rather than uh, the Vulcan cannons that Agonarch seems to be pe uh, partial to, merely because my testing against my technology shows them to be just a little bit more effective. And I shouldn't have probably told you that. No, no, I, I shouldn't have told you that at all. Oh, well, so this vehicle has more going for it than just the weapons, though we are going to put ourselves in guard mode and make sure everything is all right. We do, of course, have, as is said by the servo control there, the armor of glory. And, oh my, it is glorious. Constructed from the essence of dear leaders, blood, sweat and tears. Made by the people of North Clifthu with loyalty and devotion. I give you the armour of glory. Our indestructible, no-nonsense armour that is going to save the day from anything. Anything that Agonarch thinks he can throw at us. Or at least it will sacrifice itself in order that the uh, Weevil Dalek should be able to take out Agonarch. Glories! Citizens, during these dark and trying times, it is all too easy to focus on the negative, rather than on the day-to-day -day miracles that makes this nation great. From the endless bounty of our fields, to the might of our manufacturing capabilities, to the superior technological advancements, powerful enough to rival any force out there. Despite all our enemies surrounding us, the Kerbals of the Cthulian state stride upon the world like giants. With the greatest emperor this planet has ever seen, me, your dear leader Twitch Zhongyi, as the rightful ruler of the northern Cthulian state, victory over the ragtag rebel forces is assured. Glory! This leaves us with one theatre of operation that Dear Leader needs to secure, and for that, we are going to need the DLGV Impending Doom. That is the Dear Leader's glorious vessel, the Impending Doom. As you can see, this is a mammoth of a ship there. The fairing at top is literally the largest that it would possibly go to to cover up the vehicle inside. Uh, we have scaled up Kerberdyne systems on the inside. We have normal Kerberdyne systems on the outside of the parallel staging. We also have the massive solid boosters. I can never remember what they're called, but they're on the outside. And we are climbing at a massive 1.1 Gs. So with that in mind, I'm going to just skip all the uh, long, boring lift parts of this flight and show you all the important bits like the SRB separation here or my first part of my asparagus staging uh, it, it's all amazing you can see how many bits are being used to get this up here and this vessel is so large I really thought that I was gonna have trouble getting it up maybe I should reword that I thought I was gonna have trouble lifting such a massive beast up into orbit but thankfully once I'd start layering on all the things I did just happen to have 
the smallest bit of positive lift when taking gravity into account. So we have done a very steep trajectory because of the height of this. I needed all my upward thrust just to get us up and out of the atmosphere. And now we're starting to lean over, trying to go for the full circularization here. Thankfully, up in up out of the atmosphere we don't have any sort of drag or anything else to worry about we've just got to get ourselves going forward as fast as possible before gravity pulls us back down which should be nice and simple i'm noting up just a bit as you can see on my nav ball at the bottom there just to make sure my apple apsis stays nice and high and we're just going to carry on burning like this until full orbit is achieved well close enough and we got to just circularize up to make sure that we can stay here nice and fine so with the nailing of the circularization of the orbit it's time to go back and shed these fairings so i can show you the beast that is the impending doom will you take in the magnificence of what we've got here okay so we've got some of the space missiles at the front i should have spent a little bit longer showing you guys that but we're gonna t look at this ship many many times we are over at the orbit of the moon at the moment because i didn't think you guys really needed to see the transit but anyway we've got lots of those space missiles on the front we have a goalkeeper on the underside of this vehicle because this is an orbiting station this is well an orbiting base an orbiting ve vessel it's not something that i intend to actually put down on the moon all that often i do i can i have made it fully capable of landing on the moon i have small engines underneath to be able to slow us down and make us put down nicely but this is mainly a um, equatorial defense platform i'm going to put this in the lowest orbit i possibly can around the moon and for those of you that aren't aware of how low an orbit you can get around the moon uh, that is 10 kilometers without hitting any mountains and that gives us a rather interesting property because if we're 10 kilometers above the mean sea level of the moon and almost every single piece of land on the moon is above mean sea level that means that with the 10 kilometer loading range my vessel can attack anything anything on the equator and that's what i'm going to do with this i'm going to put it there and i'm going to claim the entire equator for the glories of leader the only thing that i really need to do to make that happen is start putting myself into an incision burn like you would normally do if you're like gonna land on the moon anyway i'm just going to bring myself down my both my apple apps and peri apps to just under 10 kilometers i think my apple apps ends up just a little bit over 10 kilometers actually almost all my maneuvers were conducted using the ion drives that i stuck on the back of this vessel this wasn't just for efficiency even though efficiency was quite a large part of it i also wanted to get that cool almost star destroyer effect on the back but once i found myself down at 10 kilometers i thought it best to make a quick orbit just to make sure everything was okay and i wasn't going to blow everything up and yes i managed to make it all the way around and everything was okay but i did notice that i was coming down over the top of the eastern crater at the moment or coming down over the top of yeah yeah i, I was gonna pass over the top of the eastern crater so i thought i'd uh, sort my vessel out and as we come to wrap up this episode, I am going to put it down into a nose forward situation. I, I never know which way to put my vessels in orbit. And then get one of my Kerbals out on the vessel that, well, the moon base that Agonarch had destroyed for me. And watch the ve my vehicle go overhead. The impending doom there, providing protection for all Clothulians, whether they are on the moon or off in Clothu itself. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for joining for this adventure. I will see you next time where Dear Leader is going to just rule the world. Because that's what he does. Bye-bye!